Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. My name is Scott Barker. I run Partnerships and Revenue at Sales Hacker, and I'll be moderating this uh, discussion today. Uh, we've got a great presentation laid out for you. And what we're going to be discussing is how to win more competitive deals with a competitive intelligence playbook. So as sales professionals, as marketers, uh, we have to go head to head sometimes. There's uh, uh, largely, most of the time, there's a, a competitive landscape out there. If you're lucky enough to not have one, well, good for you. But most of us uh, have to deal with some sort of competition um, in the marketplace. So that's what we're going to be diving into today. And got an amazing guest joining me today. But before I introduce uh, David here, uh, a few quick housekeeping items. So everyone always asks me, are these recorded? Can I get my hands on this? Um, they are. So we do record these and we send them out about 24 hours or so uh, after. So don't worry if you don't get it right away. Uh, it is most definitely coming. And the second point is, as always, these, we do these for the sales hacker community. So we want to get you involved. If you have some burning questions uh, about this topic, uh, please go down to the Q&A section. It's just at the bottom there. Let us know your name, your title, uh, what company you're with, and definitely ask away. We'll do our best to weave some through uh, as we go through this presentation. And then we'll have some time at the end for a little Q&A as well. Um, but we've got that out of the way. Now I get to introduce my guest. Uh, I am joined by David Dunlin. Uh, David, welcome, man. Welcome, Scott. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. It's Thursday. Right. We are, you know, getting close to, to months end. So for some of us out there uh, joining us, it could be could be crunch time right now for some people. So um, appreciate everyone spending the, the time with us. I know we got to get those deals in. Um, but yeah, David, so I always like to give just a little more color um, to your background for for the audience's sake. And so David is currently the CRO at Crayon. And uh, one thing that I found really cool in your bio is you're actually a TEDx speaker as well, uh, which I want to ask you a little bit about as we go. Um, but you've previously held sales leadership roles at some really cool companies like Engage, uh, a, a little company called HubSpot. I don't know if anyone's heard of those guys. Just <laughs> so who, who knows? Um, so yeah, some, some really cool companies there. And then on top of all that, um, I understand you also are a lecturer at uh, the Boston University, where you're from, Boston. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm a frequent lect lecturer at uh, BU, talk to a lot of um, students who have marketing degrees and, uh, you know, just share with them that, um, you know, today, if, if you're not um, practicing digital marketing, whether it's social media or simple as building out a website, um, you're, you're behind. So just making sure that students today understand the uh, landscape. Uh, I'm also very involved at uh, my alma mater, Bryant University in Rhode Island. Uh, Bryant University has a, an amazing uh, sales uh, training curriculum now. Now you can actually get a major in being cool. a sales professional uh, led by uh, Dr. Stephanie Boyer. Uh, she's done some really remarkable work and I'll actually be speaking there uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, um, uh, to a bunch of uh, students and, um, and trustees. So uh, try to get out and try to uh, share as much knowledge that I have uh, to as many people because things are, things are just moving too fast, Scott. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> That's kind of the, and I love that. And it's about time that sales has become a, a major and taught in universities. Um, but I'm with you. You know, that's, that's <laughs> part of the reason why, you know, Sales Hacker exists is just a place where people can go uh, to get, you know, information on what the, the best and brightest are doing in the sales profession because, you know, the pace of innovation both on the technology side and the process side, is, it's very hard to keep up. Um, so that's, that's cool. Um, all right. So let's dive uh, right into it. I think uh, to kick us off, um, I think it would be great to uh, do a poll, just see who's, who's joining us today. So it can kind of help us frame this conversation uh, as we go. But before we get to that um, quick, quick agenda, what we're kind of going to be uh, running through um, is the state of competitive intelligence. So we'll kind of set the tone 
Um, then we'll run through the competitive intelligence playbook, what that is, what it looks like. Um, of course, we need to hear some, uh, some war stories um, from uh, David's time uh, in the trenches. Uh, I know he alluded to a Muhammad Ali approach, which I'm very excited <laughs> to, uh, to hear about. Uh, we did a little video together before this. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap up with, with some final thoughts and Q&A. But let's, uh, let's get to the poll. And what we want to know is, who are you? Are you in sales? Are you in marketing? Are you in sales enablement? Are you an executive? Or are you none of the above? And you're just like, I just want to hear these two goofy guys <laughs> chat for, for an hour. So I'll give everyone uh, about 10 seconds to, to fill that out. And all right, let's close the poll, see the results here. Okay. All right. Well, as expected, right. as expected, here we go. We're, we're sales hackers. So 74% are in sales. 11% um, uh, is in marketing. 14% uh, in sales enablement. Uh, and 14% from uh, the kind of executives. So thank you, everyone, uh, for filling that out. That'll be uh, super helpful for us as we as we roll. All right, without further ado, David, I'm gonna let you uh, kick us off. Yeah, so first of all, um, uh, awesome to see so many uh, sales folks on the webinar today. I assume that everyone on the phone has already crushed their uh, March or quarterly Q1 number. So uh, hats off to all you guys for that. And uh, for those that are in accelerator land, uh, I hope this will help you make a few more bucks as you bring in those last deals. Um, so just a little background on uh, the concepts of competitive intelligence. Um, how I kind of think of competitive intelligence today is um, if you look at the state of a sales and marketing funnel, uh, marketers and sales executives have been able to get really, really strong visibility into their sales and marketing funnel. Uh, how many leads, how many of those leads convert into sales, uh, a great visibility into the customers and the behavior of their customers. And they've done this with, um, with technology, uh, whether it's a, a HubSpot or a Salesforce or uh, any other type of CRM or platform. Uh, companies have been able to really track and analyze how their customers, how their prospects engage with them and really understand what's going on inside the four walls of their company. Um, but if you kind of think of today, what's going on outside the four walls of my company. So I have great visibility of what's going on, whether it's through HubSpot or CRM. But if I want to understand my market, uh, my competitors, uh, even maybe my customers or my partners, if I really want to get a lens into what's going on outside the four walls of my company, there really isn't any uh, technology today that has uh, provided the um, same amount of uh, data or uh, insight into that as uh, we can understand inside the four walls. Um, and there's just so much happening so fast. And, you know, even with the emergence of the internet, it's, it's just impossible for one person or an army of people to really understand what my, what is my market doing or what's my market trending? What are my competitors are doing? How do I maintain uh, a competitive position in the market? How do I make sure I don't lose customers or don't lose market share? So really folks today really don't understand what's going on outside the four walls of their company. And that's what we, you know, myself and Crayon here, we really call uh, what competitive intelligence is, is understanding what's going on outside those four walls. Um, and again, you know, this actually wasn't a challenge maybe about 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, uh, you had a website, uh, your competitors had a website. Um, they put a lot of content on their website. You could download your competitors' eBooks and things like that. And, and maybe, we were just talking about this earlier, uh, Scott, but maybe they had a, a Twitter account. So there wasn't a, a whole lot of um, place of information on kind of the digital footprint or digital landscape of a company or of your competitor. Um, but today, regardless of who you are, whether you're a publicly traded company or a privately owned startup, this is what the 
digital footprint looks like for pretty much every company today. Um, every website uh, constantly and consistently is changing. Um, and I don't mean changing in terms of website redesign changes, but companies are putting out content on their blog. Uh, companies are changing and putting out landing pages to drive uh, leads. Um, companies are putting out press releases and social media. But whether companies like it or not, um, the market is talking about those companies. Uh, customers are going to Trustpilot uh, or G2 Crowd and talking about, uh, you know, do I like this product? Do I not like this product? Do I like the customer service? Uh, folks are going to Quora and saying, uh, hey, um, you know, Oracle doesn't post their pricing on their website. Can anyone get me the price of XYZ product? Uh, so Quora is an interesting forum. Glassdoor, very fascinating. You know, you can really understand the DNA of a company by how their employees um, talk about that company on Glassdoor. Um, and there's a lot of rich information about a company. Uh, is this a good company? Is this a strong company? Where their strengths and weaknesses are based on just the DNA of that company, which is their employees. Um, so, you know, this digital footprint, if you may, of one company, if you're in a very competitive space and let alone, let's say you had five competitors or 10 competitors, it's just impossible to, to track and analyze uh, all this information. Um, so that's kind of, again, what we see in terms of the growing space of competitive intelligence is that this slide that you see here as I'm talking, unfortunately, is only getting bigger and, and more confusing. So, um, you know, that's where we really see competitive intelligence is going to be such a strong aspect in, in sales and marketing. Absolutely. And David, is there, is there a hierarchy there? So there's, there's a lot there, right? There's a lot there to process. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this slide and it's like, that's overwhelming. I got to now go find, you know, people on Glassdoor, which I agree with. I'm actually shocked that more people when they're choosing a vendor don't actually look at Glassdoor for like that overall health of their organization. But this is a lot. Do you, in, in your opinion, is there, is following someone's news and PR more important than you know, the content they're putting out on, on Vimeo or are, are forums the best bet? Any of these more important, would you say, um, to make sure that your reps know about if you can only prioritize, let's say, a few? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in terms of, you know, some prioritization might matter in the industry you're in. So for an example, let's say if you're in um, aerospace and defense or uh, manufacturing, uh, patent filings are leading indicators of new product launches. Uh, you don't see as many patent filings in SaaS as you do in manufacturing, security, aerospace and defense or so forth. So patent filings is something that is a big leading indicator of uh, a company moving into a direction of a new product or in a new market. Um, yeah. In terms of positioning your messaging uh, of where your strengths are versus your competitors' weaknesses, again, from a sales perspective, uh, the review sites, um, you know, there's not enough of them. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's great information about the reviews. And, you know, what I've always found is anytime you see five or six customers talk about their, um, you know, a, a vendor or provider that has weak customer service, you know, they go to G2 Crowd and they say, you know, hey, company's okay, but customer service is weak. Well, if you look at that company now on Glassdoor, you see the exact same from reviews from the people who do customer service and they say, yeah, I'm in customer service at ABC company and management doesn't invest enough in training around customer service. So it's funny, a lot of the things that, you know, you see at, in a review site from a customer, you would see in that same review site from the person that works there. So you can almost connect the dots with a lot of these. Yeah. That's super interesting. And I, I like the way you look at that. And, the manufacturing aerospace stat is, is genius. I never would have, I would have thought about that, but that's a good little nugget about the patent filings. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what we're finding today is, um, I mean, just recently, Scott, we did this uh, state of CI report. It's the second one we did this year. And we went out, we interviewed and surveyed uh, over a thousand uh, CMOs, VPs of marketing, VPs of sales, CROs like myself, folks that are responsible for uh, research and strategy. And 84% uh, saw that when they get information, when they get competitive intelligence on a daily basis, um, they see an increase in revenue. Um, so revenue increases 
when competitive intelligence is shared uh, daily, um, which is actually a, a very interesting stat because uh, that has grown from last year. But the other stat that you see here where it's a 70%, uh, and I almost fell out of my chair when I saw this because I know what it's like being in sales for 20 years, how hard it is to sell, but how hard it also is to gather information as a sales exec, that um, sales execs are missing quota. As much as 70% of sales executives today are missing quota because instead of prospecting or putting customers through a successful uh, sales experience, they're spending as much as 30 plus hours doing research on the competition. Um, so there's a real uh, gap here or misalignment between, um, you know, marketers saying, yeah, I know that if I can get the information daily and I can get in the hands of the right people, we're going to move the needle on the on revenue. Whereas sales, they're saying, hey guys, I'm missing my number because I don't, I'm spending too much time trying to, you know, do the competitive intelligence so I can position our product, our company better in a sales process. And because of that, the consequences, I'm actually missing my, my monthly or my quarterly or whatever goals. Um, so we do see a little bit of misalignment here that, um, you know, we think that's very important for marketers and sales to really understand. Mm -hmm. and David, so I think some of the, the misalignment, in my experience anyway, has come from organizations not putting a stake in the ground of saying, who, who owns this? Like, is this, is this something that we want the reps to do because they're on the front lines? Is this something that ops and enablement owns? Or is this on marketing? Who, mm -hmm. in, in your experience, is it best to, to own competitive intelligence? Well, um, I mean, that's like saying who should own... Um, you know, who should own lead gen and everyone will say marketing owns it. But if marketing's not talking to sales, then, you know, you might get leads, but they're bad leads. And if, you know, or you're not getting enough leads and they're not quality. So I right. think they, you know, they both have to own it together. But um, when I uh, talk to a lot of marketing executives, um, they've, they've told me that product marketing uh, has been a lot of the folks that really have the, the closest pulse to the market of what's going on with the competition. Uh, yeah. The challenge is, you know, competitive intelligence is an emerging market where people are learning and learning much more today that if they don't really understand what's going on outside their company, uh, they're in a disadvantage. So we are seeing the emergence of product marketing and sales enablement uh, working closer together to really understand what's going on outside their, their market or outside their company. And then how do we take that information and put it in the hands of sales in a way where they can act on that information at the right time? Um, yep. And most importantly, if you act on that information at the right time, it produces results. Um, because there's so much information out there um, and it moves so fast, you know, the challenge is it's hard to do all this stuff manually and then know what's important and what's not. And how do I get this information and put it in the hands of salespeople? And then how do I make sure that they use it? Um, but our customers have told us that when we get the information and we, it's the right information and we deliver it daily, um, with the right message, uh, we see significant results in, in sales and marketing. All right. Yes. Let's, uh, let's do another poll here. Cause I'm, I'm curious, having been at organizations that are, I would say decent at this and then organizations that were atrocious at this. Um, <laughs> I, I want to know who's joining us. And the question is, how often are you receiving competitive intel from your marketing team? Um, or if you're a marketer, I think there was 11% of your marketer, how often are you sharing? Is this something that's happening daily? Is this happening weekly, monthly, quarterly, ad hoc, or whenever, you know, you see that latest, uh, uh, you know, news article on your competition? Or lastly, I never received or share competitive intelligence. And we'll give a few more seconds on that one. Mm -hmm. David, what's your, uh, what's your guess on this one? I think, I think, um, I mean, a year ago, I probably would have said quarterly, um, but I would be, um, I, I think we're going to see uh, either weekly or monthly um, pop up as the strongest. Cool. Um, all right. We'll stop the poll now. Wait for the results here. All right. Oh, wow. There you lots go. of lots of opportunity out there. <laughs> definitely, def wow. This is this is pretty shocking. 
Um, So the results here are, so 24% never receive or share competitive intelligence. So definitely lots of room for improvement. Uh, 44%, this, this didn't surprise me too, is ad hoc. I know, you know, people are throwing things in Slack channels and, and stuff ad hoc, which is, it's still pretty shocking. Um, quarterly, 5%, monthly, 10%, weekly, 17%, and daily, which is the optimal, is only 5%. And what was that fact again, David? Eight, if, you're, if you're sharing it daily, you, 84% of organizations who are sharing head of intelligence daily saw a revenue lift. Correct. Yep. The lift in revenue uh, daily, 84%. And 70% of uh, sales executives said they were missing their number uh, because of spending too much time uh, doing their own competitive intelligence. So it looks like when you see the 44 and the 24, I mean, that's 66%. Uh, so that, that, that's, um, um, you know, I, I, now we, you know, we see where a lot of that time goes. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so quickly, we've got a, a question here from, from the community. And um, just so everyone knows, I'll, I'll usually get to the questions quicker. If you don't go to the chat, you actually go to the Q&A. But Jonathan Keen <laughs> has a good, good question here. Um, so working in a small 20-person SaaS startup, we put the responsibility on the reps to research one competitor and own that info. So they each kind of own one competitor. Um, any other ideas for a small but growing company in ways to take the burden off of the reps to do the research? I actually like that idea. Um, if you're going to have the reps own one competitor, um, I, I actually, I'm, I like that idea. Um, you know, and maybe what you do is they own one competitor and you have a, um, you know, whether it's a session once a week or biweekly and each rep um, uh, presents on what the, what the findings they've learned on that competitor. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't think, you know, it, it, I understand the time essence of it, but you know you can use your uh, reps to um, you know combine their efforts. So if everyone takes on one competitor, um, the one thing you just have to make sure is that you make it consistent. Um, what happens, especially with a lot of small companies, is they do these like projects. They say, "Hey, we got a great idea. Uh, every rep is going to take a competitor, and then uh, every Tuesday at four o'clock or uh, every Monday at five o'clock, we're going to order pizza and beer." And each rep is going to go up and present their findings. And then uh, you do that for a couple of months and you stop doing it. Um, so I, I think that's actually a great use of time for the sales reps. Uh, I also like that because if the sales reps ever aspire to become uh, team leads uh, or managers or just overall leaders or, you know, it, it, these are skills that they should, they should learn anyway. Um, so I love that idea. But if you're going to do it, uh, do it. Um, don't, don't do it for a couple of months and be like, uh, it's not really work. Do it, you know, put stake in the ground, say you're doing it. Uh, and, um, and just make it part of the entire overall uh, culture of the company. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent agree that it's not, it can't be a one and done exercise. Um, yeah. that's where these initiatives kind of go to, to die, get a, even get a, a live breathing Google doc out there so that other people can add to it as they're, they're getting more intelligence in the field, having conversations. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree. Awesome. <laughs> Let's keep it rolling. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the playbook and how sales organizations can uh, leverage CI. So here's my really my three-step approach here. Um, first one, obviously, is very simple. Uh, know who your competitors are. Uh, identify who your competitors are. What is the landscape? Um, the second one is uh, capture how to capture your competitor movements, um, how to understand what are the key signals of that competitor that you should be tracking and monitoring uh, and capturing. Uh, and then third, um, turn those insights or turn that information into actionable results, um, making sure that you're closing the loop and you're taking the steps to um, you know, get better in uh, competitive selling. So it helps affect your overall pipeline, but using that information uh, to win and also track to make sure um, the efforts you're putting in place is working. Um, so this is the, um, what I like to call the uh, sales playbook for competitive intelligence. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is identifying the landscape. So there are really three types of competitors. Um, 
there are your direct competitors and you know who they are. Uh, you know, if you're Coke, who's your Pepsi? Um, everybody knows. Uh, if you're Oracle, who's your SAP? Everybody knows who your direct competitors are. Um, so those are the ones that you obviously have. Maybe you mark them as your tier one uh, competitors. Um, indirect competitors, well, these are um, competitors that you might not think they're your competitors because you don't go head to head with them, but they offer complementary uh, capabilities. Um, they could be a partner. Um, they could be a uh, larger company that, uh, you know, could possibly acquire someone uh, to get into your space. Um, but these are the folks that take up maybe again, they don't, you don't compete with them in a sales situation, but from a marketing perspective, they might take up a little bit of your market share, uh, buy a few more Google AdWords with your name on it. Uh, to try to get those leads. Um, so those are what we call our indirect competitors. And then there's aspirational competitors. There's competitors that um, they don't compete with you for the business, but they actually inspire uh, your business strategy and your marketing efforts. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was at HubSpot in 2008, our aspirational competitor was Kayak. Um, so I didn't compete with Kayak. We didn't offer travel. We offered inbound marketing. However, the way they marketed, uh, the way they uh, talked about the voice of the customer uh, inspired us to market that way. Uh, so Kayak was one of our aspirational uh, competitors. Uh, here at Crayon, one of our aspirational competitors is um, BuzzSumo, SEM Rush. Um, you know, they're very strong with product marketer users. So the voice of our customer uh, is using either BuzzSumo or SEMrush today. Um, and we find that the way they market to that persona uh, is very strong and very powerful. So uh, for Crayon being a competitive intelligence platform, we look very closely at SEMrush and BuzzSumo. We look at them as our aspirational uh, competitor because we really were really inspired with their business strategies and their, and their marketing efforts. The next part of the playbook is capturing the information. What are the key moments or key signals on these competitors that you really should be looking for? And again, I'm going to go back to my spider web slide here, my digital footprint slide, um, because I want to reiterate, there's a lot of movement going on. Um, if you are competing with small startup companies that don't have the infrastructure to add a lot of content to their website, there's still people talking about them. Uh, or if you only compete with publicly traded companies because it's available in news and PR, um, when publicly traded companies make changes to their website, it's leading indicators that they're gonna be doing something. So this is still a very important piece uh, to the competitive intelligence concept of what you should be tracking and monitoring. Um, so what you're looking at here is just a list of what I like to say 10 uh, key insights that are leading indicators that could really help you uh, in a sales situation. Um, so things from, you know, campaigns and events, what events are my competitors going to be at? What ones are they sponsoring? Which ones are they speaking? Uh, if they're sponsoring an event that's not in my, you know, not in my target audience, I might want to understand why. Um, or if a company that I don't consider as a competitor sponsoring an event in my target audience, I'd want to understand why. Uh, pricing and packaging, very popular one, but very effective one. Uh, companies change their pricing a lot. Uh, they change their packaging a lot. Um, uh, more than a third of companies today still put their pricing and packaging uh, on their website. Uh, and a lot of them change it multiple times over the course of over the year, over even the quarter. So how do I stay on top of uh, what pricing uh, and packaging offers that my competitors might put in? Um, but as you can see, there's multiple different areas. And then you look at like product features, as I mentioned before, uh, product features, things as simple as like a patent filing is a leading indicator that my competitor might be going into a different market uh, or my competitor might be launching a new capability based on the patents they filed. So we look at what are the things that you should be really looking at uh, when uh, a competitor, what are the movement or the signals that a competitor puts out? And these are probably the 10 top ones that 
that uh, we look at in sales and that I recommend sales reps should be looking at or marketing should be working with sales to, to spoon feed. Awesome. So just got an example here of some pricing changes. Um, you're looking at, um, uh, looks like this is Intercom. So Intercom puts their pricing and packaging on their website, um, but you can see they change it very frequently. Uh, you know, they've made changes in June of 2018 and then make changes again in July of 2018. Um, you know, the, these are, you can't be sitting on their website all the time, but there's a lot of ways that these companies are always changing their pricing. They're always changing their packaging. And this is a very simple way and really understanding uh, what a competitor is going to do. If a competitor adds a new product to their uh, package, that's, that's something that, you, you know, your sales team would need to know about. So they're not blindsided. Uh, when they're going into a competitive call. Um, if you actually look at the bottom here, you can see a Trustpilot review. Uh, Trustpilot is a great place, uh, just like G2 Crowd and other reviews, to really understand um, where the weaknesses of my competition. If my competition is weak uh, in certain areas, maybe it's like customer success, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, but you know, how do I expose them in a way where I'm not saying the competition's weak at customer success, but I'm saying, you know, our strength in the sales process is customer success. So again, it's all about finding what's the right information or what's the right insights that I can now use um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of my sales process um, so I can position our strengths versus my competitors' weaknesses. And again, as I said, you know, I talked a little bit about Glassdoor, but there's this whole source of online chatter going on, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, I know for me, I check Glassdoor for Crayon all the time because <laughs> I'm always curious to see how happy the, our customers, I mean, our uh, employees are here. It's a, you know, one of the most important things to me. Um, but I also look at companies like Crayon or other companies. I, I love to just understand the DNA of that company. Is that company on the way up? And Glassdoor is a great leading indicator. So, you know, there's a ton of third-party sources where you can get uh, great information on, you know, what are the weaknesses of my competitors, but also what are the strengths of my competitors. If my competitor uh, is, only has strong reviews and all these third-party sources, I mean, that's stuff that I might not need to have to fight in the sales process. So whether there's weaknesses or only strengths, this is information that as a sales executive I need to know. Definitely, definitely. And quickly, just want to go to uh, the community, some great, great engagement, great questions. Um, so we're definitely hit on a, a topic that is top of mind for people. Um, all right. So one here is, uh, so Mike, uh, Mike Faber, Mike, thank you for the question. Um, and his, his question is tracking this stuff as a rep seems, seems over, overwhelming. Um, there is a, you know, we just went over how many different, uh, avenues there are on that spider web slide. Um, what tools should sales reps be using daily? Um, if they're not getting those daily updates from their marketing team, maybe their marketing teams left them out to, to dry. Um, yeah, what would absolutely. you suggest? Yeah. I mean, one of the ones that, uh, is probably most effective and free is Google alerts. Um, Google Alerts is great. Um, and if you put in your competitors in Google Alerts, um, any uh, movement on your competitors, you'll get notified. I, I think Google Alerts is daily. I don't know if they do real time, um, but they definitely do daily every morning. Um, so Google Alerts is probably the most sensible and easiest way to get spoon fed information about what's going on with your competition. Yeah, yeah, great. Great advice. I've had success uh, myself using Google Alerts. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> when in doubt, Google it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, just, so here's just some examples. We showed a pricing example and a G2 Crowd example, but here's an example of, um, again, um, Glassdoor. Uh, you're looking at some reviews here, uh, salesforce.com. Um, and again, What's also kind of interesting here is uh, how deceiving the stars are. You see some folks giving five stars here or four stars, but uh, they actually have some pretty strong cons uh, in the glass door, such as uh, no clear advancement path uh, or limited opportunities beyond, beyond headquarters. So you actually see a kind of a consistent theme uh, here on glass door. Um, so sometimes seeing um, if a company, one of your competitors gets a five star review, uh, don't stop there, um, because if you actually peel, peel the onion back a little bit, 
uh, you might find some le leading indicators on where you can expose their weakness uh, and talk a little bit more about your strength, uh, you know, in a sales process. And here's another one here. Um, this one's about Marketo. Um, I was at HubSpot for about seven years. Um, Marketo was one of our, our top competitors. Um, and uh, G2 Crowd was a, a great leading indicator for us to really understand how to position uh, against Marketo. Um, if you actually read a lot of these reviews, uh, all of them uh, lead to uh, customer support uh, and customer service. Um, in fact, one of the things we did as a test is uh, whenever we were head to head with Marketo in a sales situation, uh, we used to say, okay, um, you know what, let's do this. Let's, let's dial 1-800-HUBSPOT uh, and uh, see what happens when we call the free customer service hotline. And, you know, we'd call, you know, we tell the customer, call 1-800-HUBSPOT. Right away, someone pick up, hi, this is HubSpot. If you're a customer or prospect, I want to help you. And they'd be like, wow, that's kind of cool. And then we say, okay, let's call 1-800-MARKETO. <laughs> you call 1-800-MARKETO and um, you didn't get anybody. Um, you got nobody. Maybe, maybe in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but when, when you were, you know, it, and it was so simple, but, you know, to the buyer persona we were selling to, we learned that customer service was their number one, uh, one of their number one um, pieces of value that they look at to determine who they're going to go with or the vendor. So once we understood that that was a weakness of, our, I mean, a, a strength of ours and a weakness of our competition, uh, we were able to expose that really early into the sales process. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting, especially at that, that time, right? Marketing automation wasn't as, as widespread, so you needed that that customer service. So that's an, that's an awesome insight you guys picked up on. Yeah. So, so we talked a little bit about identifying your competitors and we talked about some of the sources such as Google alerts and some sites to get information on your competitors, but this stuff is useless if you don't take action on it. Um, and this is maybe where someone in marketing, uh, maybe it's product marketing or someone else in the marketing or someone in sales enablement can really help out. Uh, we're hearing a lot about battle cards. Um, some companies call them cheat sheets, dirt sheets, but battle cards are a, um, uh, you know, a piece of content or a sales enablement device that really quickly and easily tells the sales rep what their competitors' key differentiators are, uh, how to go into a competitive situation. Um, a lot of companies uh, invest a ton of time of energy in uh, competitive profiles or uh, pricing uh, comparisons. Um, someone had a question earlier today about, uh, you know, I have, I'm a small startup, I have sales reps uh, taking one competitor. Sales presentations are great. Um, have someone own a competitor and maybe uh, once every other week do a presentation on this is what I'm learning about the competitor. Um, and then from a data perspective, you can never have too much data. You really got to understand uh, your win-loss analysis. Uh, you really have to understand what is your win-loss analysis? What does it mean to move the needle by a few percentage points uh, as, we, um, as we win against the competition? Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about how you can take action uh, from a sales enablement perspective, but also how you can measure all this. So we're going to talk about acting and winning. So first off, um, you want to track all of the stuff in your CRM. So regardless of the CRM that you have today, um, it's very important that sales is putting this information uh, in the CRM. So if sales is on a deal right now and it's a competitive deal, uh, they have to track this in their CRM. Um, if they win the deal, awesome. If you lose the deal, guess what? I, I get it. You might be a little embarrassed that you lost the deal to a competitor, but um, there are people in your organization that want to help you uh, to ensure. So you got to be very transparent and focused on putting in um, uh, who you're going up against on every deal in your CRM and then uh, identify uh, if you won that deal, what were the leading indicators to win it? If you lost that deal, why do you think you lost? Um, so, you know, something we do here at Crayon is uh, we just put in some fields in Salesforce. We use salesforce.com here, but whether it's Salesforce or HubSpot or whether CRM you have, it's really easy to create fields and just say, yeah, if this is a competitive deal, uh, who's the competitor? Uh, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Uh, be very transparent about it. This also makes it easy for other sales folks uh, to be able to read this content and use it uh, so you can scale if you're hiring a lot of salespeople uh, relatively quickly. It's a great tip. It's super important. 
Yeah, and, and Scott, once you get all this information, then you can get your metrics. So um, you can understand what your win loss is. Um, and to identify what your competitive win rate is, it's, it, it's very simple math. Uh, whether it's a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, however you measure your business, look at the number of closed one opportunities over competitor A, um, and then take the number of total opportunities against competitor A. Um, divide that and you'll get your competitive win rate. So when you understand what your competitive win rate is, um, this not only helps uh, the sales folks uh, try to identify new ways on winning more competitive deals, but from a sales manager perspective, this greatly influences the pipeline. Um, so if you are in a publicly traded company, um, you got to be solid on your forecasting. Um, if you are in a fast growing startup and you got board meetings and investors every month you got to report to, you got to be really solid on your pipeline and forecasting. So you really need to understand your competitive win rate um, because this really and deeply impacts uh, your pipeline. Um, if you're used to uh, seeing the sales reps close 25% of their opportunities, you know, for every four opportunities, they're going to win one deal. Well, because the market is growing so fast outside the four walls of your company, if you really don't understand what competitors are crowding in, that 25% can get small very quickly. So this is something you need to act on right away uh, if you're in a position like myself in sales management or sales leadership. That's super interesting. And I'm surprised that that's not more wide, like widely spread adopted in companies. I don't, I don't see this that frequently uh, with companies that I talk to that they're that they're forecasting based on not just their overall win rate, but their competitive win rate in each, uh, each competitor that they have. That's an excellent point. I like that. Yeah. 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 And, and, and the, the questions that, I mean, these are very simple questions, but the questions that every sales leader should really be asking themselves is um, when I look at my pipeline, my sales team's pipeline, how many deals in this pipeline are competitive? Um, and now if I have my, um, you know, my average win rate on each competitor, um, I can have really a clear lens in how this is going to affect my pipeline. Um, and, you know, from a sales leadership perspective, that's where you can say to yourself, okay, do I need to invest more in competitive training or do I need to work with marketing and generate more pipeline? Um, so this is a new area where a lot of companies just haven't seen this before. Um, in fact, a lot of our customers we ask them about uh, their win loss and their competitive win rate. A lot of them don't have it. And then we say, well, why are we talking today? And they say, well, we got blindsided. We, we, thought we, wanted, we thought we had a deal that we won, six-figure, seven-figure deal. Then all of a sudden, competitor came right in and swooped it up. So we see this is really impacting our pipeline and the way we do business. Um, and this outside factor, we, we got to jump on it. So these are, you know, these are three easy things that you can do that can really help you with your pipeline science. That's great. So I talked a little bit about how do you arm the sales team. Um, now that you have the data, one of the easiest ways to arm your sales team is to create battle cards. Um, and what's great about battle cards is uh, because, um, you know, battle cards today are more digital. Um, I know some companies, they have the, you know, kind of PDF battle card they print out. Uh, the challenge with that is if the market changes or the competitor changes, uh, this, this can't change. Um, so battle cards uh, should be digital. Um, what's great about digital battle cards is it's easy to find them. Um, and most importantly, um, you can actually measure uh, the effectiveness of them. Um, anything that's digital is uh, measurable. So, you know, we find as you look at the stack here that um, because 77% of buyers don't even speak with a sales rep without doing independent research first, this tells me that um, I, as a sales executive, better understand my competition better than my buyer because my buyer is already looking at the competition. I got to go into every sales situation knowing that my buyer is already looking at the competition. So if I don't understand the competition uh, better than my buyer, um, then I'm toast. So you need to be more informed about your competition. Uh, than your buyers. And battle cards is one of the easiest, most effective way of doing it, especially if those battle cards are digital. Um, and then if you do have battle cards in your company, just some kind of quick tips for sales uh, when leveraging battle cards. 
Um, for the folks building the battle cards, try to make them as real time as possible because things move fast. For sales executives, when using battle cards, don't get stuck into feature comparisons. Um, don't talk tech. Um, buyers don't like tech. Um, buyers want to understand how this is going to provide value for me. They don't need to understand every little widget. Um, don't use AI, machine learning. Oh, we have AI and machine learning. Don't talk tech. Um, no buzzwords. Yeah, just, just keep it simple. Um, but most importantly, give marketing feedback. Um, if a battle card has been super effective, Slack them, email them, buy them a breakfast sandwich the next morning, let them know. If the battle card was not effective or out of date, uh, talk, to your, talk to your closest marketer friend because that's the most important thing. If these are, if these are working then, and you tell your marketer, uh, marketing friends, they're going to build more of them for you and they're going to make sure that they're bigger and better and faster and more effective. If they're not working from you, then you've got to work together to try to figure out how they become effective. Mm -hmm. David, I've got a question for you. Something that I, I used to... Uh used to be the bane of my existence when I was uh, selling was when I would, you know, a, a deal would come onto my plate, whether it was inbound or I was doing some prospecting and I would find this, this account and they're like, they were right in my wheelhouse, but maybe I was late to the deal. My, my competitor was already there and they were 60% of the way through the uh, sales process. Any tips for when you're late to a deal um, in the form of competitive selling tips? My advice would be um, do what you do best. Um, if you have an unbelievable sales process, Scott, and I'm sure you do, um, and your sales, uh, the folks that you sold to in your career uh, probably talk about it all the time. Oh, Scott Barker, I mean, great guy, but man, you know, that sales process was amazing. I wish I saw that on the floor of my sales team. I wouldn't change a thing. If I came in 90% late to the game and they're like, yeah, we're going to make a decision in, you know, a couple of days, show me your platform. I'm going to say, well, before I can show you my platform, I got to put you through my sales process. Um, and if they don't like it, well, you know what? You're probably not going to be a very good customer anyway. Um, because we do things a certain way. So our customers get a tremendous amount of value in what we do. So I'm not gonna change the way that has made my customers successful just because we're late to the game. So, you know, I don't know what's the right or wrong answer, but I've always told sales executives and myself, you gotta just stay disciplined. You are, if you're a successful sales executive, you are there because you've been very disciplined with the process. Mm -hmm. Don't cut corners, don't skip steps, just stick with it. If the customer's not having it because you're late to the game, you know what, they're probably, you know, either two things will happen. They probably would have been a pain in the neck customer, mm -hmm. or guess what, they're gonna come back. They always yeah. come back. People yeah. really respect a strong sales process. I, I know I do when I buy stuff here for Crayon. Uh, it's very important to me. Yeah, yeah, great, great advice. And I've firsthand, you know, tried <laughs> both of those and one been like, no, I know how to do this. Stay in my lane. Let's do this properly. Yeah. And then other times kind of been thrown by it and tried to like, okay, let's play catch up. We don't need to like cover all our bases. Let's just get to where they're going because they're already informed and uh, it's come back to bite me. So great yeah. advice. Thank you. Yeah. Always does. Um, so just to recap here quickly, what I was just talking about in terms of the CI playbook and, and then I got a couple of quick short stories to tell because we're almost at the hour. Um, Again, you know, CI, know who your competitors are. Who are your direct competitors? Uh, who are your competitors that uh, could play in your market? Who are your aspirational competitors? Uh, use some third-party uh, capabilities out there, reviews, Glassdoor, Google Alerts, and really try to understand what are the leading indicators to really know your competitor and how you can know your competitor even more than, and than your buyer. And then just le leverage the stuff. Uh, if you have a CRM, uh, you got to track it. Uh, you got to track the stuff in your CRM. If your battle cards are in PDF, you got to make them digital. Um, you can't track anything in paper anymore. It's got to be digital. If a battle card won a million dollar deal for you and it was a PDF, you have no idea where on that battle card was effective 
uh, to repeat to win the next million dollar deal. So make your battle cards digital, very easy to consume. Make them mobile optimized if possible because you might have sales reps in the field, um, but you also got to collect all every bit of data because over time this will affect your pipeline science and that could cause major, major consequences uh, when you're trying to go raise or whatever you're trying to do for your business. Story time. Story time. Okay, so I have two uh, stories. So I've been in sales since uh, 99, 2000, I guess. Uh, professional sales. I mean, I've been co-calling since I was like 13. Um, but I have two uh, stories and I have one loss and one win. And, and these are all true. So we'll talk about the, the loss. Um, long time ago, um, I was in a very competitive sale and our product was better. Our product was faster. Um, we had um, uh, better uh, support. Uh, we had a better brand in this market. Um, we, were, we were the experts. We were, we were number one. In fact, we were even cheaper uh, than, um, than the competition. Um, and uh, I lost a, a very large deal. Uh, and I was, I was shocked. I, I, it just didn't make sense. I know, I mean, did everything right. The discovery call and, um, and everything that they wanted, uh, we did better, faster. Um, pricing, we were significantly less expensive because we were just more innovative. We, we could price better uh, than our competition. And um, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So my boss was, at the time, was really curious how I, how I lost the deal. Wasn't mad at me, but curious. Um, and, you know, I forecasted like any good sales exec, hey, it's coming in, it's coming in, it's coming in, I'll bet my job on it, didn't come in. So my boss said, let's get them on the phone. I'm curious where we missed in the sales process. So I was in my boss's office and he dialed on the conference call, uh, conference phone. And we got the person on the phone and introduced himself. We introduced and we said, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're a little, dis you know, we're, we're, we're not disappointed we lost the business. We're more disappointed that we, we think we missed something in the sales process. And um, we'd like to understand, you know, what we, what, what we missed. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. The person on the other end of the phone told my boss, Dave did an unbelievable job in the sales process. Um, showed us the product, uh, un answered all our questions. Um, and we, we actually really liked your pricing. Um, we actually, the reason we went with the other vendor is we like the other sales guy better. We like them better. Ouch. And, um, and that's when I knew people buy from people. You can have the best product in the world. You could answer all of their questions. You can fill out the RFP. You can have a better pricing. You could be a dollar and they're a million. Doesn't matter. People buy from people. And what I learned was that that other salesperson gave a much better, uh, got a better reaction, a much more, um, not positive, but a, a greater reaction when putting people through the sales process. They liked my sales process. They thought it was very professional. But the experience they had with this other sales professional, um, they told me was, they just said, look, this, this, this was an unbelievable sales experience that we had. And that's when I learned people buy from people. Um, so that was the first time I really was disappointed in a loss, but I, I learned a ton. Um, and uh, since then, I've, I've been able to apply that in, in competitive selling. Yeah, that's an awesome story. It's, it's so interesting. I was actually just reading this article earlier this week, and I couldn't decide if I agreed with it or I didn't agree with it. And I was leaning towards disagreeing with it because that's, that's been my philosophy. My whole sales career has been, you know, be uh, the trusted advisor one, but like I want them to be someone that they'd want to hang out with and have a coffee or a beer with. Um, and there was this article and it, it, it was uh, basically saying that they felt based on some, some survey they did that you don't actually need to be liked as a sales professional to, yeah. to get something over the line. You just, you need to be the more informed, more educational, uh, consultative salesperson. And in that case, you were that one. You were the more professional by the book 
you know, trusted advisor, all of that. And it, it tipped over because um, of the, the likability factor. So um, yep. you just solidified my viewpoint on that article. I, <laughs> I, dis- I disagree now. <laughs> That's cool. I love it. Thanks for sharing. Excited yeah. for the next one. Absolutely. So my one win, um, and I, this is where I got kind of my Muhammad Ali approach. So um, when I think of selling, uh, doing competitive selling, I think of Muhammad Ali. Uh, Muhammad Ali uh, would talk about the, you know, his competitor in the in the press conference before the boxing match. Um, but once he got in the ring, and he was all business. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I found that when you're in a competitive sale. Um, on the first engagement with the customer, you mention the competitor's name once. You never mention them again. Don't ever bring them up again. Uh, now it's business. Um, you say one thing, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, um, based on all the research I've done before our meeting today, uh, I can tell you uh, company A is not a good fit for what you, what you guys need. And that's it. Uh, you, you leave it there you leave it now you're in the ring you're all business um and uh true story um i had a really competitive um really competitive deal um and i didn't even think i was going to win it um but um we had a face-to-face with a a potential customer big deal um our competitor who was the billion dollar company the 800 pound gorilla came on site um, fortunately, I got the meeting last. So if you're in competitive selling, always get that meeting last. And um, they've already made up their mind. They were going with the other company. And um, I came in and they said, the first thing they said off the bat is, what, what, what's, your, what's your differentiator? And I said, well, uh, this company that you looked at, um, they're the best in this. Um, this is what they're the best in. Um, and they've been the best in that for years and there's no, uh, there's no talking about it. Um, what you're going to get with me is, um, you're going to get, uh, one throat to choke. Um, if you're not happy with any aspect of this relationship, you call me, don't call the 800 number. Um, you're just going to call me. Um, now they thought about it and they said, okay. And they're like, well, what kind of person are you? I said, I'm a cowboy. Now, I'm not a cowboy, but, you know, I like to have fun. I said, I'm a cowboy. I like to have fun. And they said, you know what? That's, that's the type of person we want to work with. Um, and I actually learned this from my loss, that I lost the deal because they liked the person better than, than me, even though I had a better product and everything. So basically what I did was, is I just took all the strengths of my competitor. I mentioned my competitor's name once. I told them what they were the strongest at. Um, but I told them with the di- biggest difference is you get me. Um, and this is who I am. And a lot of people like working with me. And, and they kind of shook their head and be like, you know, we kind of like your style. And uh, they couldn't make that decision any faster. So it was a fun, very fun experience to, to do that. <laughs> That's awesome. That is a great story and uh, extremely uh, inspiring. And I love that. Just putting it, putting it all on your back and just, yep. you know, owning it up. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> perfect. Well, David, thank you so much for all the insight uh, today. We got great engagement. Uh, tons of people joined us. So uh, thanks for all the insight. You're such a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I appreciate you hanging out with me for, for an hour or so. And uh, yeah, for everyone who joined us in the community, thank you so much. And uh, go out there, get some competitive intelligence, um, and uh, go and crush, crush your quarter. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck, everybody, uh, this month and this quarter. And I hope this was a, an effective uh, webinar for everybody. So thank you. Awesome. And if people want to connect with you, uh, LinkedIn, best way to do it? LinkedIn, um, easy to find. Uh, David Donlin. Uh, my Twitter handle is D-D-O-N-L-A-N. So at D Donlin at Twitter. Uh, So easy on Twitter if you want to use that as well. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, everyone.